Again, hello everyone. I'm Aaron Lieberman. I'm Cloud Practice Manager at Big Compass and an API design and security specialist and evangelist. Uh, I've hit a little bit of APIs um, from almost every perspective. So I'm very happy to be your MC for this stage. And I'm very excited to announce Mike Ralfson, Open API Specification Lead at Postman. And he will be talking about the state of OAI. And so Mike, you can go ahead and begin and share your screen and get started when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, you can see my screen, I guess. Yeah. I can. Okay. Let me, uh, having slight technical difficulties here, but uh, hopefully you can see uh, you can see the slide. I so can welcome, see. yeah, welcome to the state of the OAI talk. Uh, I hope you're all enjoying uh, the conference and the rest of the, all the other great presentations. Uh, during the next 35 minutes or so, I'm going to be covering the Open API Initiative, or OAI, uh, specifically what it is, what it does, and how you can get involved. So this is a very personal take on the title of this talk. Uh, so please take everything as a kind of jumping off point uh, to learn more details about the OAI, uh, more about what we're going to work on, uh, what we're working on now, uh, what we're going to be working on in the future. Uh, so the subtitle of this talk is why you should sometimes need to take off your overcoat on a cold day. And hopefully we'll come back to that uh, subtitle at the end. Um, yeah, as Aaron said, uh, my name is Mike Ralston. I'm based in the UK, near London. Uh, this is a picture of me wearing a hat. A uh, photo is initially a little visual joke uh, to indicate that my social media profiles were having a bit of a sleep. Uh, later I forgot to change it and the image kind of stuck. Uh, in my working life, however, I pretty much wear two hats. Um, since December 2017, a little while after the release of version 3.0 of the uh, Open API specification, I've been a member of the OAI Technical Steering Committee, or TSC. And since April this year, I've been the Open API specification lead at Postman in the Open Technologies Group, where I work with Kin Lane, Matthew Weinbold, Fran Mendez, Ben Hutton, and others. Uh, it's a great team. Uh, basically, everything related to Open API is within my remit. Uh, so rather than just Open API within Postman the product itself. So I do everything from specification work, uh, community engagement, and open source tooling. Um, I'm also the author of a number of open source Open API tools, and I'm the maintainer of the APIs Guru Open API directory. But uh, it's probably a few too many hats. Um, so there's my contact information. I'm permitted sock on Twitter. That's short for the permitted society, as opposed to the permissive society we kind of promised in the 60s and 70s. I'm Mike Ralston on GitHub. Uh, we can also find my email address there if you need it. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, but that's probably not up to date because I'm not uh, currently looking to change where I'm uh, where I'm based. Um, so just as I'm wearing two hats, uh, this talk's going to be broken down into two rough halves. Uh, there's no significance in the choice of fruit in my little stock photo there, but uh, there are not not that many images, I'm afraid, in this talk. It's quite heavy on the text. Uh, I thought we could just do with, uh, with another picture. So the two halves of this talk are basically the what and why of the Open API initiative. So that's basically going to concentrate on the structure and the aims and deliverables of the hey, OAI. Mike, I, yeah. I wanted to interrupt you really fast. Yeah. We still see the title slide, the state of OAI. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's not good. There we go. We see two halves now. We see two halves, but now I can't see my speaker notes. That's annoying. Um, window play. Um, is two halves what you're meaning to show? It is, yeah. Uh, I just got to be a little lost without my speaker notes, unfortunately. Um, uh, if I can get those into a different window, that would be great. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's carry on. Um, so the two halves of um, of this talk, we're going to concentrate on the what and why of the Open API Initiative, the structure and deliverables, and the where and the how of Open API Initiative, which is going to concentrate more on the community and engagement um, 
let me just see whether I can um, do apologize for these technical problems. Um, so, yeah, we're going to focus on the what and why of the OAI. Um, so why does the OAI exist? Um, so the OAI is an open governance body formed within the Linux Foundation to foster the donated Swagger specification. Um, so the, that's, uh, the Open API initiative was created by a consortium of forward-looking industry experts who recognize the immense value of standardizing on how APIs are described. As an open governance structure under the, under the Linux Foundation, the OAI is focused on creating, evolving, and promoting a vendor-neutral description format. So the OpenAPI specification was originally based on the Swagger specification donated by SmartBear Software. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little lost without my um, speaker notes. So the OAI Charter is um, the, the founding document of the OAI. Um, it's, it's there to... Um, Um, so this is um, a slide, I, it's the earliest slide I could find um, with the uh, initial members of the OpenAPI initiative. Um, there were 10 founding members um, who are on that slide, but now we have uh, over 35 um, members of the OpenAPI initiative. Uh, I'm very proud to say that Postman is, is one of those. Um, why get involved in the Open API initiative? Um, firstly, and the thing that probably occurs to most people is to drive forward the specification um, and support the work we do, um, getting the word out um, about the specification itself. Um, if we um, if we don't get that word out, then the specification uh, isn't going to flourish. Uh, it's not going to be as successful as we want it to be. And we do try and keep barriers to entry uh, entry to uh, contribute as low as possible, but uh, we're trying to do more in that area and there's always more we can do. Uh, so what defines the OAI? Um, we've seen that the OAI charter is our sort of defining document. Um, the OAI has a mission statement, um, <laughs> which again is in my speaker notes and I'm not going to be able to remember it off the top of my head. Um, but our membership is, um, the core of the OAI, but it's not a pay to play situation. Um, the membership is there to support the work we do with the specification. Um, but the members, yeah. Uh, if we're struggling with the presentation, what we can do is we can have Aislin actually share, and then you can you can read off your notes while she's um, through the presentation. Would that help? That that could help immensely. Yeah, let's go with that. Aislin can go ahead and share in the background then. Uh, Mike, just go ahead and say when you need the slide changed. And yep, then absolutely. Can change yes. the slide, and we can do it that way. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so if, if we're still on the uh, Get Involved slide. Um, so again, um, we want to innovate and support more use cases and provide better authoring and tooling experience. Uh, supporting the work we do uh, recognizes the importance of a machine-readable uh, API contract and uh, helps drive adoption. 
Um, now, people may have the impression that uh, the OAI is either a closed organization or it's a closed process or it's a closed specification. Uh, we want to get across that that's not the case. Uh, next slide, please. So the mission statement of the Open API initiative is to provide an open source community within which industry participants may easily contribute to building vendor neutral, portable and open specifications for providing technical metadata for APIs, such as the Open API specification, and supporting tooling for validating the integrity of the specifications or instantiations of it. The OAI is not is as such not intended to be a destination for community or consumer focused tooling outside of the specification itself. Uh, membership, as we've seen, is not pay to play. And the OAI is also defined by the boards of, of people who get involved in the actual sort of decision making process. Uh, we have the TSC or Technical Steering Committee, the TOB or the Technical Oversight Board, and the BGB or Business Governance Board. And we'll cover all of those a little bit uh, in more detail. And the, um, the OAI also deals with the administration and legal side, uh, handled by the Business Governance Board, and uh, with help from the Linux Foundation. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So as well as the core Open API specification, the OAI Charter now allows the community to work on multiple related specifications uh, related to HTTP APIs. Uh, this includes things like the overlay specification, uh, which we're going to come on to in more detail, which has its own GitHub repository. Uh, the work of the SLA for OAI group, which looks at service level agreements for APIs, and additional products of a new series of special interest groups, which are springing up. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the charter of the OAI creates the scope within which we work, and as such, it as much defines what the OAI does not do as well as what it does do. So the OAI does not produce tooling, uh, not even reference tooling to work with the specification. Now, partly that's so we remain independent of our members and their tooling offerings and those of the open source community. Uh, but largely, it's a practical matter that the sheer range of things you can do with the OAS is so broad that any set of reference tooling is likely to cover only a small subset of that functionality and would have consequently quite limited usefulness. Um, stemming from this, we also don't test or validate OS documents ourselves. Uh, there's tools out there that do that, they're very, very good. Uh, nor do we test tooling itself for compliance. Uh, again, partly that's to maintain independence, but we also simply don't have the resources of time uh, to do everything we might want to do uh, although in the future, who knows, these things these things can change. Um, now, apart from documentation, such as the specification itself and the new Getting Started Guide, uh, the OAI does not also directly offer training on the OAS. Um, again, that's something we may look at in the future with help uh, from the Linux Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the community? Um, so we have the TSC, um, are effectively the group of maintainers or committers to the project repository who also have voting rights, uh, only if they should be needed, uh, to prove material changes to the specification itself. Uh, the TSC gets to define the roles within the community, such as a maintainer or a contributor. So we could widen the number of people who have commit rights if we needed to, and we're definitely trying to widen the definition of a contributor to include everyone who's had an impact on the specification, on the other deliverables within the repository, uh, to the organization, uh, helping everything run smoothly, and to the processes behind that. So the development process itself is documented within the GitHub repository in the development markdown file. Um, and we in the TSC try and act as shepherds uh, for the specification, not gatekeepers. Although our job is sometimes to say no to proposals that don't quite fit into the specification, we're far more focused on getting those changes into a good shape, uh, trialing proposals within the wider community before they go into the specification itself, uh, encouraging people to experiment with uh, specification extensions and utilizing additional specifications such as overlays. In addition, uh, we've got a small triage team who have the ability to label and close GitHub issues, uh, such as in the case of answered questions, uh, duplicate issues. Um, there's actually been over 180 contributors to the, uh, the OAS GitHub repo, 
Uh, of course, that only includes people who have made commits to the specification itself or files that are held within that um, within that repository. Um, the Technical Developer Community, or TDC, is everyone who, um, who contributes. And the forum for that is our regular weekly Zoom calls uh, on a Thursday. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the current TSC consists of Ron Rotowski, uh, formerly of Smart Bear, Marsh Gardner of Google, Jeremy Whitlock at Google Apogee, Daryl Miller of Microsoft, Rory Sarid, formerly of MuleSoft, and myself. And the former members of the TSC include the uh, sort of father of Swagger, Tony Tan, and Jason Harmon. So the TSC was expanded in December 2017. Uh, I was quite actually surprised to be asked to join um, because my first PR to the specification uh, was simply to correct a missing full stop. Uh, but the experience of contributing, uh, having that contribution be sort of gratefully uh, accepted, no matter how small it actually was, uh, spurred me on. So over the next few months, I contributed a number of small fixes and improvements uh, to the then in progress version 3.0 of the specification. Uh, I guess I gained some kind of reputation for someone who'd read the spec multiple times, that's many, many, many times, and so could make updates which were sort of in keeping uh, with the specification and respectful of the house style. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the structure of the OAI comprises several areas which aren't directly concerned with the content of the specification itself. And one of the most important is the marketing group. So this group chaired by Marsh Gardner, uh, involving loads of support from our Linux Foundation project manager, Neil Caden, uh, looks after the promotion and messaging of the OAI, uh, without which the specification would be, as I said, much, well, much less well known or successful and two areas which the marketing group regularly engage with, uh, engage with our community are by the Twitter account, which is OpenAPI Spec, and the LinkedIn account, uh, OpenAPI Initiative. Uh, all these links will be um, linked to uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but they also handle things like running conferences, uh, such as the API Specifications Conference, uh, formerly known as AppyStrat, and dealing with sponsorships of other events to get the, um, the OpenAPI uh, name out there. So as we discussed earlier, there's also the Technical Oversight Board, or TOB. And that's a group designed to be able to resolve any issues which the TSC uh, can't deal with. And so far, we've actually only come close to invoking uh, the TOB just the once. And that was on the issue of um, what the version of the spec beyond 3.0 should be. Um, there was a lot of debate about semantic versioning and how that applied to specifications. Um, whether we should go with version 3.1 or version 4 and what the sort of um, the marketing implications of that would be and what people's expectations of a version 4 of the specification would be compared to a 3.1. Um, so we nearly needed the TOB in that instance, uh, although the actual TSC vote ended up being unanimously in favour of uh, calling it 3.1. Um, and we also have another group, uh, which we hope would only be need to be invoked very rarely, and that's the Code of Conduct Committee. Uh, they would handle any issues related to the community, including online or and in-person interactions, um, anything that doesn't go as well as obviously we'd all hope. Uh, the Code of Conduct is prominently featured in our GitHub repo, as well as on the website and on our accessible meetings slide, uh, which we put up at the head of every TDC uh, Zoom call. So the final uh, section of the OAI is the Business Governance Board, uh, or the BGB, and that has representatives from all the member companies, um, and their responsibility is primarily the day-to-day -day running of the OAI uh, within the Linux Foundation, uh, and dealing with um, things like our budgetary um, information. Uh, next slide, please. So what have we delivered in the uh, Open API? Uh, since it's been uh, donated to the uh, OpenAPI initiative. Um, OpenAPI specification version 3.0 um, was obviously the, um, the first major work. Um, that was to overhaul, update, and improve the version 2 um, specification, also known as the Swagger specification. Uh, version 3 was certainly, we hope, more flexible, 
consistent and compatible, such as with um, the JSON schema draft four that the uh, modeling side of the specification was based on. Um, we also produced three patch releases um, on top of 3.0, and they focused on clarifications, corrections, readability, and examples. So those patch versions shouldn't affect the meaning of the specification, um, and they shouldn't cause tooling vendors to have to make any changes. Um, they're just there to improve the, uh, the process of, of onboarding um, and making it easier to understand the specification. Now, as I said, OAS 3.1 was, despite just a minor version bump in the version number, it was quite a big step forward uh, because we actually uh, achieved full compatibility with the most recent JSON schema draft, which is 2020-12, uh, which I believe Ben Hutton's probably been talking about um, today. Um, we also had a contribution, uh, it's very much appreciated for out of band registered webhooks, that's uh, webhooks that aren't registered by an API call, but they're registered in some other way, like a, um, signing up on a, a web form. And security improvements, uh, such as support for mutual TLS and allowing scopes um, or roles on a wide range of uh, security scheme types. And next slide, please. So what are we working on now? Um, overlays is, is one of the biggest uh, items we're working on. And we're gonna come back to that in more detail for anybody who's unfamiliar um, with that as a concept. It's really interesting stuff. Um, we have a milestone, which is basically titled the big list of post 3.1 items. And we break that down into descriptiveness. That's items that change what the specification can actually do, what it can describe, and authoring improvements. Uh, it's making the process of creating OAS documents either by hand or with tooling uh, more efficient, more pleasant. Um, and we're looking at um, splitting our efforts in a little bit so we get more asynchronous communication and more focused work on areas of the specification and sister specifications. Um, via special interest groups. And we're going to take a look at uh, each of those in turn. Uh, next slide, please. So what's being considered in that a big list of post 3.1 items? Um, a lot of people are coalescing and working really well on um, backlinks, which is um, like the links uh, feature that's currently in OpenAPI 3.0. Uh, one, um, but this would allow the links to be defined in the opposite way to how they are now. So an operation could describe where to get the information from to populate things like parameters and request body, rather than where we have it now, which is um, the specification, everything is, uh, all the links are against a response and their pointers to other operations. Um, the code gen JSON scheme of vocabulary work um, that's looking at enhancements or possibly even constraints on the expressiveness of the JSON schema dialect to improve the quality and accuracy of generated code. And that's going to be a cross specification working group. Um, so it's not just um, people from the OAI TDC. Um, it's going to be people from the JSON schema community, people from the async API community, which is a sister spec of the, open, uh, of the OAS concerned with event driven architectures, uh, message based APIs. Uh, as well as the OAI TDC themselves. Um, we're going to look at things like optional and multi-segment path item key components, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but currently, path parameters in the Open API specification are currently always required, and they can't span or include segment boundaries or forward slashes. Um, and we're looking at finding ways to um, get rid of some of those um, restrictions um, but without creating ambiguities in the processing of the specification for tooling. Uh, we originally aimed to do that work for version 3.1, but we needed more concrete ideas and people to help out, so we bumped it. Um, but there's definitely demand, and we want to look again at that. Um, similarly, with uh, disambiguating request response parameters uh, based on query parameters, that was bumped from version 3.0. And security improvements, which is a huge area, uh, such as how do we have better support for JWTs and Jose, or Jose, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, um, especially important uh, for the fintech industry. Um, 
But how do we do that without making the specification itself um, much larger, um, harder to um, get to grips with on initial reading? Um, and whether we do that in a, a side specification or a document that can um, live to the side or in extensions, that kind of thing. And uh, next slide, please. Um, we're also looking at alternative schemas. Uh, that proposal was to allow um, many different kinds of schemas and not just the JSON schema draft for support we had in version 3.0. Um, we somewhat put that on the back burner when we decided we could support full JSON Schema Draft 2020-12 um, because now we have the mechanism to support any past or even future drafts of JSON Schema. But things like support for XML schemas, Apache Avro, gRPC protobufs, uh, all things we want to look at and hopefully align with the direction of support uh, that those alternative schemas have in async API. So you don't have to do the work twice or in two different ways if you're working both with uh, synchronous HTTP APIs and with messaging based APIs. So the discriminator keyword um, is one of our JSON schema extension keywords. And for historical reasons, it doesn't work exactly like a JSON schema keyword should. Uh, we're looking currently at a series of really good improvements to the wording and the specification around discriminator to nail down some of those issues. Um, but also if we can replace it entirely with something which is going to work much better with um, JSON schema. Um, and we then maybe look at uh, deprecating discriminator in the next version of the specification. Um, also some more minor issues possibly. Um, request response schema hints um, to give back some of the functionality um, which was lost when read only and write only became annotations only. Um, and scenarios, workflows or orchestration are all sort of uh, terms for the same kind of thing we're working on. Because uh, OS is great for describing the surface area of your API, but it doesn't really say anything about how calls should be chained together to achieve a particular outcome. Uh, or what calls you need to do as prerequisites uh, to get the information you need to um, to make a subsequent call or how the security actually interacts with that. Um, so that's an area which is being um, looked at by um, one of our special interest groups. And uh, a really good suggestion which came through a GitHub issue was support for structured headers, uh, RFC 8941. Um, that's becoming a much more popular way of describing uh, headers in HTTP rather than everything being defined in an ad hoc way. There's now a, an RFC that gives you structure for um, for this the content of an HTTP header. So we want to look at mapping adjacent schema representation of header onto that standard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, authoring improvements. So when it comes to authoring improvements, uh, overlays definitely fit into that category because an overlay is a separate document which allows bulk transformations, uh, additions to existing OAS documents. Um, high level of abstraction possibly um, on top of uh, OpenAPI for people who want to write it in a slightly different way because the OAS is sometimes criticized for being quite verbose and if your API fits into certain constraints such as it always deals with JSON, it doesn't deal with XML or anything else. Uh, if it always uses a standard um, problem details uh, RFC for non-successful responses, et cetera, um, or if it has common traits, such as things like pagination, sourcing and filtering, um, maybe that higher level abstraction uh, could be useful to help you write the OAS documents. Uh, reusable groups, uh, something else we're looking at. Um, again, we looked at it for version three, but we didn't get it into uh, 3.1. Um, it's area related to traits. It's the ability to reference more than one component at a time to um, improve the reusability uh, within the Open API document. And many people have expressed an interest in the ability to store more API lifecycle attributes within OS documents. Um, so user defined extensions can help with that, but people do want more common standard that they can interact, um, interoperate with um, other consumers. Um, so that's a question of whether dates, uh, so when you're deprecating or replacing um, elements within your open API specification, or whether you want pointers to additional versions of the specification, um, that's the, the kind of thing that um, people are exploring there. 
Uh, we also want to reduce some elements of confusion in the specification. So there's areas where um, we haven't quite got the wording exactly nailed down and it turns into a frequently asked question. Uh, one example is the version field within the info object, uh, what it, exactly it means, um, because it should describe the version of the contract, not the version of the implementation, but that's not always uh, totally clear. Um, so we're, we're trying to reduce um, the, the need for people to keep asking the same questions there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, some of the areas we've touched on are now going to split off into special interest groups um, to try and achieve greater velocity in development and improve the asynchronous communication so not everything has to get done um, in our weekly uh, TDC calls. Uh, they're going to move forward those areas of interest um, and they may end up as uh, core OAS proposals. They may end up as extensions or whole um, additional sister or side-by-side -side specifications as areas that have already sprung up and this is not a definitive list there, there may be more um, in the near future um, are covering areas like workflows or orchestrations like we mentioned overlays uh, security which is a huge topic um, the code gen vocabulary lifecycle information slas and vertical industries, uh, especially travel, is one that's, um, that's already set up. Um, next slide, please. So we'll take a quick detour into overlays, uh, exactly what they are, because um, they're um, certainly one of the things we hope to deliver quite soon, because it's not part of the actual uh, OAS um, specification, so we can ship it separately. Uh, next slide, please. So what does an overlay actually look like? There's a, an example of uh, what we're calling a structured overlay. Um, so we've divided the examples um, in the overlay proposal into several different kinds. Well, the syntax is actually exactly the same uh, in this and the following uh, example. They're just different applications of the way um, the overlay mechanism works. So here the target of the overlay is the um, is the root node of the OS document that's indicated by the, the at uh, James path um, expression. And the overlay merge object follows the same structure as the target document. Um, so you have an info section, a path section, components, tags, etc. Uh, just the same as a normal OS document. And everything gets merged there. Um, so in this example, we're adding descriptions um, and summaries and rate limiting extensions. Um, so overlays are very, very flexible because they can target any JSON or JSON-like documents. So something can be in YAML as well. Um, so overlays can be used with async API as well, not just um, the open API specification. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is an example of what we call a targeted overlay. Um, here, the update section, um, there's multiple updates, um, each with their own target, and each one could select a target node or nodes uh, within the OS document, and it implies a merge or an add operation in that location or locations. So the structure of the target OS document doesn't need to be replicated uh, for areas that are not being affected by the overlay. So here, um, a particular path is being added, a uh, description, um, and then um, uh, another path, the path slash bar, um, the post operation within that, um, we're adding um, the X safe extension there as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so things you can do with an overlay, uh, internationalization. Um, so if you want to produce uh, versions of your OS document uh, to produce uh, documentation, for instance, in uh, many different languages, Overlays can help you with that. You maintain one core OAS document um, and apply the internationalization on top of that. Things like additions by technical authors. Um, so that's getting into um, the collaboration process around uh, generating your core OAS documents. Um, not everybody is an OAS um, expert. Um, not everybody um, is a developer, for instance. 
Um, but technical authors, maybe they're, uh, they're the people who are going to be writing the descriptions and summaries and those kind of things um, that the overlay document can add in to the core document before you produce your final uh, document for your consumers. Um, you can also add things like extensions for a specific target audience uh, or for targeting um, use of your OS document with a particular API gateway. Um, you can also, with an overlay, you can remove information that's not required uh, for some consumers. So you're only presenting the information that they actually need. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're also going to take a little detour uh, into the work of the SLA for OAI group, which is dealing with service level agreements. Um, take another a little look at um, what an example of that might look like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so version one of the SLA for OAI specification, which was recently released, um, has a define or can define a set of metrics, and then it defines plans, and plans uh, contain limits against metrics, and those uh, plans are mapped to OAS paths and operations. Um, so as well as having header uh, metadata um, like the info objects in OAS and it has a link to the target OAS document. Um, so you can see in uh, this um, section of an uh, SLA document, um, the metric that's defined is the requests metric, which is a type integer, um, has a description. Um, you have multiple plans. Um, you have the free plan or the pro plan here. Um, and each one um, links against a path and uh, a method uh, giving you an operation within the, OS, the target OS document. And here we see that for the free plan, the request metric has a maximum of one, uh, one request uh, per period uh, of one second. Um, then in uh, another plan, that metric, um, uh, that um, limit against that metric could be different. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we've looked at what um, we've currently, uh, what we've actually shipped and what we're working on. Um, so what's in the future? Um, obviously in the future is a potential OAS version 4.0. Um, the question there is whether there's an appetite for fundamental breaking changes in the specification, um, what would require um, a version four, or whether we're going to produce more 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, those kind of uh, minor version bumps. And people also ask about integration with async API. And there's definite uh, pros and cons of having a combined specification. Um, the pro is that you only need to learn one specification and you can deal with your HTTP APIs and you can deal with your messaging or event-driven APIs. Um, the flip side of that is that a combined specification would obviously be sort of nearly twice as long. Um, it's going to be harder for people to uh, get to grips with. It takes longer to read. It takes longer to learn, uh, that kind of thing. So um, at the moment, um, async API is uh, progressing on its own um, uh, trajectory, and open API is uh, progressing on its trajectory. And we're very much uh, keeping an eye on what everybody's doing in those two uh, arenas, but there's no current plans to merge the two specifications. Uh, next slide, please. So why do we want engagement um, with the OAI? Um, partly it's to validate the design decisions that are being made, because uh, what we don't want to do is make decisions and have people come to us and say, ah, oh, no, that, that really doesn't work in the real world. Um, or they have some problem with it because um, the currently engaged members of the TDC, they don't know everything. They don't have exposure to every use case. Um, so part of that is bringing other voices to the table. I want to draw out ideas, uh, solutions from people who, have, who currently experience pain points using parts of the specification. Um, and that gives us the ability to explore uh, alternative directions and compare uh, alternative solutions and look at the potential trade-offs involved. Um, and have more information uh, to guide um, the decisions uh, that we make. Next slide, please. Um, so what do you get from engaging with the OAI? Um, you're knowing you're helping not just the specification, you're not just helping machines talk to machines. Um, 
you're helping, uh, you're not just helping tooling providers deliver more features, but you're helping people do their jobs and deliver projects and APIs that they're passionate about. And some of those APIs uh, could even help change the world. We just don't know. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so moving on to uh, the shorter part two of um, the specification. Uh, next slide. Um, covers the where and how of the OAI. Um, next slide, please. So where to find out more? Um, first port of call would be the website, openapis.org. Um, the GitHub repository um, for the core specification, um, the overlay specification, and the getting started documentation are all within the GitHub OAI organization. Um, that's where you can in, uh, engage with the GitHub issues, discussions, and pull requests. Um, SLA for OAI is currently in its own GitHub um, repository. Uh, again, there'll be a link to that uh, right at the end. Uh, we have a rendered version of the specification at uh, spec.openapis.org OS latest HTML. Um, that's a little bit easier to read for uh, people who um, don't necessarily get on with GitHub's Markdown preview. And we have a Slack instance. Um, now we're trying to improve the process around this because, because of the, um, the way um, that the Slack uh, instance is sort of funded. Um, we have the spec channel that's open to everybody, but it's not self invite. Um, so we need, we're trying to improve that process. Um, OAI member representatives get access to additional channels, but anybody, uh, whether they're OAI member or not, who wants to work uh, on one of the special interest groups, uh, they can get an invite into those channels as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so additional resources uh, for engaging with the OAI. Uh, definitely um, keep an eye on the uh, the Twitter, which is OpenAPI Spec. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, um, a lot of the uh, things like the blog posts are cross-posted to LinkedIn. There's a very healthy um, community of people commenting uh, in LinkedIn. Keep an eye on member company blogs and um, obviously Stack Overflow as well for uh, technical questions uh, related to OpenAPI. And next slide, please. So how can people engage? Um, we want all the interactions um, that people make to be safe, inclusive, and healthy. Uh, so for that reason, we do have this code of conduct, which covers online and in-person interactions, as I said. And we have the code of conduct committee to handle any issues that get referred. So every uh, regular Zoom meeting has a link to the code of conduct uh, prominently displayed. We have our inclusive meeting slide, which is thanks to a community member called Alex Savage. Um, next slide, please, uh, shows um, that slide. Uh, so we record the meeting for future reference, um, want everybody to feel comfortable, and get reports of any language or behavior that's harmful or not inclusive. Um, and we try and run the meeting with, um, it's it's fine to interrupt, um, but for people who feel less confident doing that, um, Zoom has a sort of raise your hand feature and we'll try and um, get around to everybody and make sure everybody's voice is heard in those meetings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing we're certainly looking at is what can we do better? Um, more geographically accessible meetings would, would probably help. Um, we have meetings that are scheduled for uh, morning uh, US time, evening um, European time. But that does still exclude um, potentially some people in other time zones. Um, we, we, we'd love to hear um, solutions that can help with that. Um, Another thing we can look at is possibly the automatic captioning of meeting recordings uh, for people uh, who have accessibility needs there. Um, generally working to create a more diverse and inclusive community. And on that subject, we'd love to hear more um, from people on that subject. Um, next slide, please. So um, basically, uh, this comes back to the subtitle of this talk, uh, despite the January weather, um, JFK took off his overcoat, stood there and asked for people to get involved in the processes that affect them. So um, I'm saying 
please ask not what the Open API initiative can do for you. Um, next slide, and obvious conclusion, but what you can do for the Open API initiative. Uh, final slide um, is a tiny URL state dash of dash OAI. Um, and that's a link that will give you all of the uh, links to the resources that I mentioned um, during this talk. And thank you very much for listening. All right, Mike, very interesting presentation. We don't have any time for questions, but love the, the um, collaboration that, that you encourage there. I even mentioned, um, you know, Yuri Sarid, you know, who I've worked with in the past over at Mule Stop. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to see some of those names come up. Awesome presentation. Again, if you have any questions for Mike, go ahead and put those in the in the chat. And uh, we're going to move on and, and actually end this track. And we'll see you back, it looks like, after a break, after lunch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.